we'll continue on this topic of flux balance analysis. Um, so, um, you know, let's take an example of a product that we want to make. Because so far, uh, and I think this is like the really interesting way to motivate flux balance analysis. Um, so far, what we've been what we've been blending is this way that we calculate theoretical yield with um, you know maybe some measurements that we take and eventually a model that we create for how an organism's flux is distributed under certain circumstances. So we saw it's different if you grow on glucose, different if you grow on acetate. And that's why, you know, if you're a modeler, you can sort of spend an infinite amount of time um, picking different scenarios and supplying different organisms with tracer compounds. And we'll talk about that in, in next time's lecture, um, just to understand what, what uh, natural organisms do. Now, the frontier of that, where, for example, Machek's group has been more actively involved in, is you can work with engineers to be able to do those measurements when an engineer has modified an organism. Because under the backdrop uh, of, of everything that we've been talking about is this idea that you have a choice, that you could make glucose come in one way versus another way. Um, and you know how you would do that is uh, something we'll talk about later. Um, it's, in that case, it's not quite the protein engineering strategies that we've mentioned. It's more about genome uh, engineering um, because, you know, this is a native gene on the genome and you just want to delete it. Um, but so similarly here, um, you know, you can use, so you could take a model of flux that an engineer um, essentially, you could do it retrospectively or pr predictively. In other words, you could have an engineer, say, like me, mess around with the genes of an organism manually, and then you could try to characterize what has happened, and you could use a metabolic flux model to do that. Or you could use a metabolic flux model from the outset, um, which is still different than like our theoretical yield calculations, to say, how do I maximize production of something like succinate? Um, because if you have this stoichiometric model, um, you can effectively run an optimization framework on it, um, given an objective function, et cetera. So in this case, our objective would be uh, to boost flux to succinate, uh, maybe specifically to, to make this black arrow here as high as possible. Um, but it clearly couldn't just be that, or we would deplete, um, you know, the what is probably the, the suctional CoA precursor. Um, we'd have to make all of the associated arrows that lead up to that high and um, many of the ones that, that don't low while still allowing a cell to grow. And that's uh, usually a key trade-off. Um, so, right, in terms of these rational strategies I just mentioned, knocking out genes, really common one, overexpressing genes, and uh, the, the modeling, metabolic modeling community tends to spend more time thinking about these just because they have a really good understanding of what an organism already does. Um, and, you know, some folks like Machek will also get into this space of letting an organism evolve, maybe also with some selective pressure. If you can come up with a way, for example, where you incentivize or force the organism to make more of your product in order to grow, then you can let nature and time uh, figure out how, to, how things can be made better. But the reality is that you can do so much more than this that, that kind of fits into this category. Um, and this is where all these metabolic flux analysis models are really limited. Um, so for example, my group tends to spend less time in this area precisely because our entire focus is new pathways that the organism doesn't already have. So metabolic flux analysis is still useful to us um, in that we can, we can make sure that we create as much of the precursor um, to our new pathway as is possible. We can also account for the fact that our new pathway might impose 
ATP or cofactor requirements that actually mean that the cell has to rewire a different pathway just to generate more reducing equivalents, et cetera. So it's still a useful tool. It just might not be the first tool because your stoichiometric model isn't going to know what other reactions there could be. But if you figure those out and then put them into the model, then you get the best of both worlds. Um, so mostly what we'll be talking about is taking the genes that uh, an organism already has and figuring out how to modify them. And so you can see here, for example, um, perhaps something that would seem obvious, even though not all of these choices are obvious, um, would be to knock out uh, this enzyme that catalyzes the conversion of, again, what is probably succinyl CoA um, to maybe an oxaloacetyl CoA. Not sure. Um, but this might not be a knockout that you can do. Um, this might be a step that is essential um, in one way or another. It seems unlikely here because essentiality usually has to do with not the enzyme itself, but the product of the reaction. And what you can see here is that there are still other arrows that get you to OAC. Uh, and so in that case, it does seem like you could probably get away with knocking this out. So what's flux balance analysis at a high level? Um, we talked about the stoichiometric matrix and your flux matrix, and you're setting it equal to zero. And then you're applying a lot of constraints. Some other people refer to this as constraint-based uh, optimization, um, and there's usually more, more words associated with that. 